We're continuing in Shmuel, Aleph, Perik, <coughs> Tezayin. We're in Pasuk Yud Beis. So now, Shmuel is telling Yishai, he's asking Yishai, don't you have another son? So now we, so Pasuk Yud Beis, we're told the following. Vayishlach, and he sent, Vayivyelu, and he brought him, he brings the youngest son. Uat Moni, and he's red. Imifei Enaim, with nice eyes. Vitov Roi, and he's good looking. Vayomer Hashem, kum mishachehu kizehu. Get up and anoint him, because this is the one. Okay, so let's see what the Malbam has to say some very interesting things. Buad Moni. So Rashi says, this is, this is the passage that really shows what Hashem meant when He told Shmuel that people look one way, look at things one way, and Hashem looks at things the other way. If you look at David, David is red. That means the attribute of red is very strong, meaning to say, that uh, like he's born under the planet of Mars, and he was a one who was very adept at at spilling blood. So that's usually not you know such a wonderful attribute. On the other hand, there are also some good things about him. He has nice eyes. He he's good looking, and the Malum says this really testifies to the fact that the fellow is a very clever fellow has a good nature and if a human being would have to make a decision based on the pros and cons of such a person so Shmuel would have figured that he was not worthy to be a king because his natural temperament is very to kill he would not be the one to be the king but Hashem looks into the hearts and he knows that because he has those good eyes that he will make the correct free will choices and to do things only based on what Hashem wants him to do. And even though he has a very bad temperament in terms of blood, that's, that's his nature, but he'll use it only to fight wars for Hashem and to destroy uh, the people that are bad people. And that's what Hashem wants. And even if a person has a tendency in his nature to do things that are harmful, but if the person has ultimately the control over that, because he'll make the correct free will choices, then that really is, is a wonderful type of person. So therefore, Shmuel on his own would not want to pick such a person. Uh, clearly someone like that would, 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 would be looking like an Ace of Harasha type of figure. And yeah, an Ace of Harasha had tremendous potential too, if he would have used it properly but he didn't. So historically, somebody looking like this temperament would, would not be a good person to be the king. And Hashem saying, no, get up and anoint this little ki because he is the one that I want. And that's exactly what the Medrash says. When Shmuel saw that he was red, he was afraid he's going to be a murderer like Esav. And Hashem says, but he has good eyes, he has nice eyes. When Esav did things, he did it on his own. But when David will do things, he will do it with the permission of the Sanhedrin. And only when the Sanhedrin would give him permission to kill, he would kill. Okay, because that was the, the good part of the temperament, that uh, the eyes would say, hang on, you know, i got to first speak to the best. And that's what Hashem says, go anoint him, because he's the one. And uh, the, Med, the Gemara says, Rav Shingam Lil says, Ki zehu, zehu zeh, This is the one for this world, and this is the one for the world to come. That even when he's in this world, his nature might be towards things of this world because he's red, but still and all, because of the overall good nature and his good seichel and his good free will choice, he's going to be a person going to be an Olam Abba as well. Uh, one second, uh, and that's why when it says that Huadmoni, it says Huadmoni, not ve yefeanaim, but im yefeanaim. In other words, it's it, he's in that, It's not just. He's red and he has good eyes. He's red with the good eyes. I mean, the good eyes are what's going to control the red. And therefore, the violent nature within him will only be channeled in, in a way to destroy that which is evil. Yeah.
So, so, so we're saying that God knows what his free will choices are going to be down the road. Like he knows everybody. That's fine. But then he also knew what Shaul's would be, yet honoring to him, and yet he was, quote, a failure. Yeah, but, yeah, because... So God wanted him to... No, this was the one that the people wanted. The one that the people God wanted... God said that to Shaul, here's who you can anoint. Yeah, but th this is the one based on what the people were looking for. This is the one for him. This is this is this is the one that's meant to achieve a certain amount. This is the Mashiach Ben. Remember, this is Mashiach Ben. You always say the Mashiach Ben David. It's supposed to be someone like a Shoal for this. He was the best one they were going to find in that generation. They wanted a king. So this is the one. David would not be the one, the right one to be the first one. Shoal would have to be the first one. He was the best one that they had. It wasn't, it, and, and the truth was, it wasn't the right time to ask for a king. So this is what the people wanted. It seems okay. This is the best you're going to get right now. This is the best you're going to get. And the people aren't asking for a replacement, are they? Uh, because they don't know how bad Shoal is, but they're going to want a replacement as soon as Shoal dies. Right? Shoal is going to die. Hashem knows that. Right? And now it's not. It's not that. And that's what we said. Hashem saying, now it's not the people wanting a king, it's me wanting a king. This is going to be the king that I want now. Not the king that you wanted. And that's the difference. The king that you wanted wasn't going to be a permanent king. The king that I wanted is going to be a permanent king. So Shaul's only been king for what, three years? We don't know. Remember we had a whole discussion about the years of Shaul and all this? We don't know how long he's the king. It's, 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 it's not likely he was a king for only two years. He was a king for many more years. So we just don't know. That, that's the problem. I'm just struggling with it. God knows he's going to fail, yet he made him king. Well, it's, uh, Hashem gave Adam, uh, Adam Rishon the command that he mm -hmm. dates at Das. He knew he was going to fail. Sure. You know, Hashem has to lead, deal with us the way, you know, without, you know, in a way as if we don't know what's going to happen. And he gives us the free will choice. Is a real choice. That's all. It, if Shaul would have made the right field choices, then things would have worked out better. That's what it always is. We can't we can't contemplate. But when Hashem is telling him, "This is the one I really want," and this is the one Hashem really wanted, David Amelech was the king that Hashem really wanted, because ultimately from him will come the final Mashiach, which will be true. So ultimately, that is the, that with the mistakes and everything, that's the one. So, as we said before, oh, oh, many moons ago, with Reb Tzadok in his Sefer Poket Akorim, on page at Zayin of Aleph, um, he said there's, there's two ways to overcome the Yetzirah. He says, one way, is we call the way of Iskafia, is subjugating, uh, suppressing, <coughs> vanquishing, like people like Elia Novi, like the Mashiach ben Yosef. And then you have the opposite approach of Ishapche, of turning it around and taking the Eight Sahara and, and, use, and, and sublimating it for the uses that you want, like David HaMelech. Uh, and the expressions that they use uh, from Chazal, he says, uh, it says that, that after, like the analogy of the Eight Sahara, the Gemara and Sukkah says that when the Mashiach comes, the Eight Sahara is going to be slaughtered. It's going to be slaughtered. So, what does that mean? So, you know, after you, you slaughter something and then the blood goes out, so to speak, you, you, you bleach out all the blood from the, from the being that is slaughtered and that is totally uh, vanquished and it is used properly. So, when the Gemara says, you know, this is the thing, when the Gemara says the Yetzirah is going to be slaughtered, you can't take it literally. It's not to be taken literally. We're just going to kill the Yetzirah. That's not what it is. But rather, we, we vanquish it. And then we get the Yetzirah to be on our side. That's what happens. You know, just like when you slaughter something. It has blood. It's red. It's bad. Red is the bad color. But once you slaughter, you, you can spill out all the blood. And then the redness is gone. And so it gets bleached, as it were. And now it is used for good things. That's ultimately what's going to happen before Mashiach comes. Not that there's no drives. We'll have drives. But the drive will now be owned by us in such a powerful way. And you know, the HR is, you know, whenever we do Averis, we do them with much more alacrity than mitzvos. And now we're going to, you know, take the HR with all its redeeming qualities. And as long as it isn't channeled in a bad way, 
it's able to do amazing things. As b'chol Hashem with both your hearts. So that is the way of ishapche, turning it over and changing the dynamic of it. And as we said, by Shol, his name was Shol, because Shol comes from the word borrowed, and he borrowed the tactics of David Amelech. David Amelech had the ability to take something and turn it around. Shol's mission was not to take something and turn it around. The real way he's supposed to do things is to destroy things. That's it. To suppress things. But he borrowed David's tactics, as it were, and uh, although he and he was although Shol was a tzaddik, he is more apt to do iskafia to suppress and vanquish because he's the tzaddik. But uh, so therefore he made his mistake, as we said, and he said, "Listen, I could take bad things and make them into good," and that's why he took Agag and he let Agag survive because he figured, you know, I'll turn him because there was something good coming from Agag, and that was his big mistake. So. The uh, to understand a little bit of a, a, a deeper level, just to understand exactly what's going on over here, is we know there's two basic aspects to the HR. There is the aspect of taiva and the aspect of kino. You have lust and jealousy. So now, taiva uh, can be a good thing if it is uh, channeled l'shem shemaim. On the other hand, kina in general is, is just bad. So the question is, so what makes the taiva go wrong? The taiva goes wrong is when you use the taiva to pursue your own agenda, which is really driven by kina. Because what's kina? Kina really, jealousy really, is you're placing your own self before others. And that's what makes you jealous of other people. And this is the redness that we're talking about. Redness, the blood boils, jealous, right? But when the, the redness is taken away, when you shech the, the, the Yed Sahara, so then the taiva is a pure taiva. And then you have the taiva, will all be l'shem shemaim, and that's when you get pure chesed into this world. So that's the way David works. Yes, he has strong taivas, but he's able to overcome the, the kinna issues. And therefore, he only uses his taivas for the right thing. So that's the, the redness, yes, you know, there's a, there's a great degree of uh, ability to do the wrong thing. There's a lot of drive. There's a lot of taiva. And if he doesn't check his kina, he'll be in big trouble. But if he does, he can th- make amazing use of that taiva. He has a taiva to, to all these beautiful words in Tehillim. So the taiva to come close to Hashem, to yearn for Hashem. So... Um, that was the, the trick of David Amelech. So it's just like the Gemara says, if the Yetzar comes to you, what do you do? He's supposed to schlep it into the base medrash. If the Yetzar comes to you with a taiva, you take it to the base of medrash, you turn that taiva into something that will be for good. You have a taiva now to learn Adaf Gemara, and to understand Shat and the Gemara. So Shol uh, used David's tools, but wasn't able to use his tools properly. While well, David was able to use the tools in the, in the most beautiful way, and this really is the the theme of understanding how David Amelech, even though on the surface does not look like the right man, if you're in Shmuel, if you're in Shmuel and Avi's uh, shoes, but if you're in Hashem's shoes, you definitely see somebody who, if, who will use those tivas in the greatest way, and that will also be able to pull people to become closer to Hashem. So that's that's the understanding over there. Um, one second. There was one more thing. I guess not. I guess it'll be a little later. All right. Pasuk Yud Yimel now. Vayikach Shmuel as Karen Hashemet. So Shmuel takes the horn of oil. Vayim Shechoso and he anoints him. The care of Echav amongst his brothers. Vatitzlach Ruach Hashem El David Mehayom Ahu Vamala. And the spirit of Hashem now becomes strong. And David from this day forward and Shmuel gets up and he goes to Ramah so just uh, some simple uh, points first um, what does Bekerev mean over here so the mom gives two interpretations Bekerev amongst so on the one hand he says since this is a very holy act 
he wanted to do it in front of ten people. He wanted to be what we call the Farhesha, he wanted to be a public act. So you have Yishai, and you have his eight sons, and Shmuel, that's already a minion, because you know, they don't have the Shekhinah unless there's ten people there. And there's really going to be a, a Shekhinah transfer, as it were, going on to David Amelech. So the Malbim learns, it was the care of means of monks, there should be a group, it's a publicized thing. However, the Abarbanel learns that he didn't want it to be such a pronounced thing. He read, read it, at this point, wanted to be a secret, and there he learns Bekerev means from amongst, but not including everybody, and it was more of a private thing. So it's a machlokes here. Did everybody know the true nature of David Melch or not? Was it something that was more private, just between uh, Shmuel and David? And if, and if that's the case, uh, maybe even uh, you know people even Yishai may not have known the real truth about David yet either or if you're learning like the Malbim that was said in front of them then that became the great surprise that they found out now there are two things that are really if you just look at this Pusik incredible observations if, if you notice over here there, there is one thing that is totally missing in this Pusik if you just contrast this to, to Shmuel's first time he met Shaul versus this the first time that Sh- Shmuel is meeting David HaMelech no there's not one word spoken now this is a very very important event in Jewish history this is the real king that Hashem really wants is the one that is being anointed and as the Malbim brings down from the Medrash Tan Chuma in the Pasuk before, Kum Mishachehu, get up and anoint him. He say, Hashem says, this is my Mashiach is standing for you. Right? And now, and, and, and you're sitting, get up and anoint him. This is a very historical event in Jewish history. He doesn't have any word to say to the guy. That, that, that's very interesting. No, no, no words of encouragement. Nothing. And, and, and more than that, it seemed that, like, what happened? What happened to the Corbin? He told, he told uh, Yishai, listen, I can't leave here uh, till, we, uh, till we take care of matters over here. There was a Corbin to be brought. Uh, like, like, what's going on? He just, just, just leaves. It's like, unbelievable. So there, there isn't any real commentaries that explain this. Uh, I've heard some few, a couple suggestions on this. Uh, number one, we could say, based on the fact that we said yesterday, that Shmuel really, his personality really fit more with Shaul's personality and not with David's personality. So, you know, it was, uh, and, and Shmuel really could never really conceive of a David Amelech being a king. And that's, that's what the Malvin said. According to Shmuel, he really shouldn't be the king. So it's kind of, okay, I do the Rosh of Hashem, and I don't really feel any connection with this guy, but the Rosh of Hashem should anoint him, and he anoints him. And the truth is, he never really has any strong connection with David and Allah. He, not, he isn't his Navi. We we'll see that Nosan HaNavi is the one that really deals with David and Allah. It's, it's not Shmuel and David. It's, just, it's, it's not a Shirach. The personality of the Navi and the personality of this king is not. Shmuel was the personality with Shaul, and he grieves over Shaul. And that was when he really felt connected. He didn't feel connected to David. There was, and, and you know, you talk to people, speech is a form of dvekas, to connect with people. He didn't feel, you know, and Hashem never really told him that he uh, is going to have a connection with him. <clears throat> Hashem just said what? <coughs> Hashem said, take your horn and uh, go over there and I, and I found the king for him. And that's it. Anoint the king. You just have to do a very functional activity. Uh, but uh, with, 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 uh, with Shoal, I'm trying to find it right now. Um, a it, it seems that he, he kind of spoke more about that. Where is it? One second. Yeah. 
It says uh, the day before a shoal uh, stumbled upon uh, Shmuel, so Hashem, you know, reveals to Shmuel. He says, tomorrow at this time I'm going to send you a person from Binyamin and you're going to anoint him to be a nugget over the Jewish, over my people and he will save my people from the plishtim for I've seen that my people are crying out to me. You know, so it's, you know, it's going to help my people. There's a lot more discussion about who this king is going to be. So Hashem had more to say to Shaul about to Shmuel about uh, about Shaul. So then you know, Shmuel had more to deal with him. Oh, he's going to save our people. I'm going to have to talk to him. I'm going to have to do a lot of things. And but uh, here he's just it's just going to he just has a functional role. So there are two kings at this point. Well, we'll see in a minute. We'll see in a minute. Uh, we we got we have one that is going to be that is anointed. But you know, still you, know, you can't you can't be the be the official king while there's another king around. But he's in place. You know, Shmuel had to anoint him, and David had to know that he is going to be the king. Okay, but exactly who the king is, you'll see. You'll see in a minute what's going on over here. You'll you'll see in one second. Uh, so that's one answer. Another answer could be that uh, since uh, David is the real king. Sometimes when a connection is so strong, sometimes the connection transcends any use of any words at all. You know, sometimes you know words cannot express the auspiciousness of the moment and, and how special the moment is. And sometimes words limit uh, the beauty of the moment, and you know, and who needs to eat at such important times like that? So why would you take such a powerful experience and reduce it down to words and to eating? So there's two ways, and maybe they can both even be true. But uh, clearly it's, it's an unusual thing that needs more thought. Now, um, let's go on to Pasuk Yudalad. Now here it's a very important Pasuk. Ruach Hashem Sora Me'im Shol. And now at the same time the Spirit of Hashem has been removed from Shol and an evil spirit from Hashem seized Shaul. And Ralbach says it's kind of as if there was a transference from Shaul to David. As Ralbach says in Pasuk uh, Yud Gimel, uh, the Pasuk before, he says uh, that when the spirit came upon David, so just the way Shaul, when he had the spirit, was very successful, Right? So Hashem kind of took that spirit away from Shaul and he now brought it to David. There's a transference, so certainly of the spiritual power, there was a great transference, and so for all for all effects and purposes, Shaul is now on the way out. But now the Malbim says something uh, very uh, powerful. He says, What's this Ruach Hashem? He says, Who his Atmus Shefa Ruchonius. This is like the, the concentration of the divine flow in a, in, a, in a godly way, which really overcomes all the strengths and, and, and kochos of the person. You know, when Hashem, so to speak, He's with you, you know, it says, enclothes the person in a spirit of, of, of gvura and all the amazing qualities that a person has, all the mitos that you have, just rise up to the top and they are fulfilled in the most beautiful way. And you're filled with a ruach of chachma and das and yiras Hashem. And like your whole body just gets carried away with the tremendously great flow that's there. So, uh, and, and that's an amazing thing. However, when it goes away, then it says, then there's a tremendous void that's there. And all of a sudden you, you realize that all that strength and courage and yira and all that stuff, it's gone. And more than that, the person feels and can tell that the difference has happened and that confounds the person. And instead of having such a lofty spirit within the person, it becomes a depressed spirit and, and worry and concern. And it, you can understand this idea similar to the idea of Tumma. Tumma happens where? When, when there is Kedusha that is now left. Just like on a, on a simple level, when a, when a Jewish person dies, there's a tumma because the great neshama is left. And on many levels, 
you know, a person becomes Tommy when certain levels have left them. So that's the same thing with Shaul. Once you have the spirit of Hashem in you, so you feel amazingly powerful. I mean, it's like unbelievable. It's, it's you're, you're, you're psyched up, everything, and your whole being, you're, you're firing at all thrusters. And all of a sudden, when it's gone, you just don't feel it anymore. And you know what it was like, and you, now you know where you're at, and, and the gap is, is way over, too overwhelming for the person, and the person becomes depressed from it. And he even uses the word himself, the word melancholy. He says he becomes a, he develops a melancholia, as it were. So this now, it's, it's a different Shalom Elach now. It's a different Shalom Elach. Now, could be, this is the answer to what we asked last week. When Hashem said to, Sh- to Shmuel, go anoint David, go anoint a new king, and what was Shmuel's first reaction? Well, he's going to kill me. Well, how could Bichayish be such a wonderful tzaddik like Shaul Melch? How could he suspect Shaul Melch, he's such a tzaddik, that he would kill him? So the answer is, you know, what you could, the greater the person is, if now the, the shift, because Shaul, Shmuel knew that once there's going to be a new king, there's going to be a transfer of this Ruach Hashem. This Ruach Hashem is going to leave him. Now that Ruach Hashem leaves him as great as he was, and, and it became even greater with the Ruach Hashem. Now when Shaul realizes the Ruach Hashem is not there, he's not going to be himself, and he's, there's going to be such a void of spirituality, it will create a negative. It will create a negative in him, and he's going to be a violent man. As it was true, as you see, he will kill out the city of Nov really for no reason. For no reason at all. Why? Only because it was assumed that they were helping David HaMelech. It becomes irrational. And that's what Shmuel understood is going to happen. When he's going to find out that I have something to do with David HaMelech being the king, he's going to kill me. Which is not, and Shmuel's not so worried about himself, it's worried more about Shaul. That Shaul is something that's really evil. So therefore, it's, it's not like, you know, why are you suspecting the guy to nowhere? When, when Hashem pumps a person with greatness and then takes it away, the void is going to be so strong, the person can't deal with it, and he's going to do all kinds of terrible things. And that's, and that's what he was doing. So I think that's, that's, that, that is the Emes of Pshat. He's not just being Cheshit B'Cheshem anymore. The guy is no longer a kosher for a person to, uh, to be trusted. So that, that's where he's at. So is he responsible for his actions and not respect them? Yeah, because even when you're put over the challenge, you have to uh, overcome the, 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 the challenge. Hashem can give you these challenges. We're not saying he's mentally ill. You know, there's a lot of people who so, mentally ill, no, depressed. There are many people going around this world who can suffer from depression. And Hashem wants you to deal with it. Deal with the depression that you have. And, you know, don't kill people. And don't sleep all day and not get out of bed. You have it. You have to, you know, deal with what Hashem's Nisayan He's given you in the best way possible. Or in the best way for Shaul to deal with it could have been just to say, you know what, David, I'm not going to try to kill you. I understand that I can tell I'm not the king. I'll step down. Could have stepped down. But instead, he, he misreads everything about that. We'll have to see. We'll have to see how this all happens. But, you know, okay, you're not going to be the king anymore. But there's, a, there's an honorable, there's no rule that said that a king has to be a king till the day he dies. No, I understand that. I just think it sounds like Hashem made him mentally ill. Does it say mentally well, ill? Mentally comment. ill? It comment. It what is it? Here that, and, uh, even, and what does mentally ill mean? We're not talking about... Father Master that he's suffering from mental illness. That the servants of most rulers are afraid to tell their master that he's suffering from mental illness. Because they suggest that they get a heart. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I understand. But, you know, again, there's, there's mental illness. How do you want to define it? You know, a lot of, uh, most people in the world are mentally ill. You know, we have so many prescription drugs now. Uh, they, just, they do things that just don't make any sense. So you, you have to overcome it. You have to overcome it. That's what Hashem gives you, the koichas. You, you have this problem. You can live with it. You can, over, you can overcome the negative behavior that's going to come out of it. So you're, in other words, just like you had with great Gedolim, there were great Gedolim who uh, Rev, uh, no, uh, uh, Revaren Salvechik, or and all this sort of many Gedolim, Revaren Salvechik, 
speak Rosh Hashiva, right? But then he suffered a stroke, or a physical debilitating illnesses. And then um, they, they saw that he was learning Daf Yomi. So his son-in-law asked him, so I mark this as a son of Rachel. Someone else was just wondering, why is he learning Daf Yomi? I mean, he's such a big scholar, he could learn more in depth and, and all that. So he said, listen, I understand that, you know, before I had my illness, I could be a Rosh Hashiva. After my illness, I can't be a Rosh Hashiva anymore. My mind is not the mind it was before. It's still like I learned Daf Yomi. Or Rav Pam, Zichron Lebracha. Same thing, Rav Pam was Rosh Hashiva. Right, but then when he got older and much more ill, he knew he couldn't run the yeshiva anymore. But instead, he knew he was a very holy man. And he could be a great figurehead to um, jumpstart many important tzedakah campaigns. And now he became more of a person going to parlor meetings and encouraging people to give tzedakah. That a far cry from you know preparing shirim uh, to give in the yeshiva. So it's okay. I mean, I, I don't have the ability to be a rosh yeshiva anymore. You know, that's a, that's a hard thing. If a person was a rosh yeshiva for many, many years. I mean, that's a very prestigious position and it's much more uh, elevated than, quote unquote, you know, being a fundraiser, right? But great people, you know, he could have stubbornly said, I'm going to give the shear, I'm going to still be Rosh Shiva, and he could have given sure that we're not, you know, of the quality he used to give and, and, and deny the realities that he's in. And the guy said, listen, I have to come to terms with the fact that, that I'm not what I, what I was anymore. Hashem, Hashem has decided I have a different avodas Hashem. It's very hard for a person to accept that. Because a lot of people define who they are by what they were. And you can't. You can define who you are by what you are, not by what you were. So a great person will be able to overcome and say, okay, I'm no longer a Rosh Hashiva. I will now help <coughs> the Yisrael by being a fundraiser. And I'll be happy. I'll be happy with that. And and he still was a wonderfully a uh, person of um, a tremendous. The chesed of Rav Pam never left him. It always was a tremendous Baal chesed. So I guess the Shabbos is in much more time doing chesed and less time learning Torah. Okay, that's the Ratzon. I learned Torah for seventy years, seventy-five years. Okay, now I'm going to be full-time chesed. That's what Shabbos. I got no problem. Shol, you know. This, this was the first. This could have been the first time in history where a person was had the rug, you know, just taken out from under him. You don't find Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Yosef, Moshe, Aaron. Moshe was a leader till the day he died. Yeah, Hashem didn't, you know, a couple years before he did, you know, give, give him uh, uh, to forget his learning, and now Moshe had to learn to be a different person, not Yoshua. If you think about it, who who are the great tzaddik in the world that Hashem all of a sudden just say, you know what? All the great kochos you have, I've taken them away. And now continue to be a good Jew without your great kochos. Think about that. Was anybody like that? Not, not, nothing's coming to mind uh, right away. So Shaul was really given a, a, a test that nobody was tested in before. So this you know, was a great opportunity for Shaul to teach the world what do you do when you no longer can do what Hashem gave you the abilities to do with in the beginning. And there was no guidance in this area. <laughs> there's no guidance in this area. So he, he failed. And there's a lot to learn from his failure. There's a lot to learn from his failure. That when, when, when Hashem has changed your kaychas, you have to realize and you see a new budding star coming along, it's willing to happily transfer the power and say, I will now be an you know, honorary king. David, you're the one. And, and, may, and things could have been a lot better. The two of them would have been together. Who knows? Could have had much better results. But instead, they, you know, Shoal forced there to be an adversarial relationship between him and David. So he didn't have the, the success that could have happened from that. So it to be willing to, to realize when it's time to, to give up the power. Okay, Pasuk uh, Tesvav. Vayomer avde Shol I love. So now the servants of Shol said to him, Hine no ruach Elokim ra'o mevati mevaat mevaitecha. Whoa, behold, we see that that, that a, 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 a divinely bad spirit is 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 uh, is seizing you, scaring you. 
So in other words, the servants realize this, and uh, they even told it to him, you know, you're not yourself, O, o king. So Yomerna Adonenu Avodecha Levanecha. So let our servants. Uh, uh, no, um, what, what we should do is Yevakshu Ish Yodeh Menagem Echinar. We would suggest that we should look for someone who can play a musical instrument. Ve'ayavios Alecha Ruach Elokim Ra'a. And when this bad spirit comes over you, then he game be a dog. He will play. Ve'tov Lech will be good for you. So, um, they, so the mom goes through the whole, you know, dynamics of the of this illness, and says that you know there is a, you can have help. You know, this is the, the first way to treat this type of depression is with music. Music is something that can help you to to get back some of the good spirit that you had to overcome this void, as we know the tremendous power of nigun has. Nigun is a way to open up one's neshama. Your neshama is basically closed, right? You know, had Hashem helping you make your make you more aware of your neshama, and that's great. And that's when all the great kochas come out. And if Hashem has left you, now it's very hard for those kochas and neshama to be expressed and realized. So we'll just uh, we'll have to find an artificial way to get it going, which is acceptable, and we'll get someone to play in front of you, and that music will bring out that spirit for you. So they understood this, that was to be. Now who is this, uh, who is this uh, servant? Who is uh, the servant? So the Rashi tells us, this is Doeg HaAdomi. This is Doeg, we'll see much more about Doeg. So, Pasek Yitzai, Vayomer Sholom it up. So Sholom said, okay, Ru'un Ali, show for me, Ish Metiv Lanagain, Vaviosam Eloi. Get somebody who, who knows how to play and bring him to me. Sounds like a good idea. Um, now, it's interesting that they only suggested that you find anybody just a good musician. That's it. But Shaul wanted more, says the Mabum. He says, you have to find a guy, not only, you just can't pick any minstrel to play before me and to play music to make me feel better. It's got to be a person who really is a very spiritual person as well. A person who, who, who is a well-rounded spiritual individual who is deserving of, being in, of me being around such a person. You know, you could, you know, there's a lot of musicians. You know, uh, look at the people now who are the musicians of the world, the great musicians. They're the lowest of the low. And Shaul Melech still was a tzaddik. He says, you're going to bring me a musician who's, who's, a, who's a scum? He has to be a musician. He has to be a guy who can complain. The guy's a tzaddik. can't just be anybody. So fine. So then I have to look for somebody like that. Uh, <clears throat> that's what it means. Yuches. Vayan echad ne'anarim. And one of the, the, the youngsters, as it were, responded. That's Doeg. The army says, "He neira isi ben liishai beis alachmi." I see a son to Yishai from the house of Beis Lechem. Now, here, here are all the virtues. Number one, Yodea nagain, he knows how to play. Number two, v'gibor chayil, he's a warrior. Number three, v'ish mochama, a man of war. Uh, number four, unavon navar, and he's wise. Number five, v'ish toar, a man of good stature. Number six, v'ashem imo, and Hashem is with him. So uh, they, they show you all the redeeming qualities that he has. So the Malvin says how, how, uh, how exceptional and how unusual this is. Number one, he knows music. He's Mamish the best musician in the world. Yodea Nagay. He's Mamish the best. On the, but on the other hand, usually, uh, that was a concern. Usually musicians are not very spiritual people. So he's, but now he says, he has all these other characters that are not typical of a musician. Gibor Chayil, right? Valiant, right? Usually, usually musicians are weaklings, right? Very weak constitutions. A man of war, he knows the strategies of war. It's usually not the thing that a musician has. Navon Davar, very clever person, very intellectual. Uh, number five, Ish Toar. Uh, usually, uh, uh, you know, they're not the most handsome people because they just go into their own world. 
and Hashem Imo. And more than this, he saw that he was a Yerei Elohim. He was a God-fearing individual. He went away from evil things. And that's the Bible also says, usually musicians are the lowest moral people in the world. And he had his great moral constitution. So, definitely, Shmuel, uh, 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 Doig, saying we got a guy who's got all the virtues that are necessary. Now, there's much more to elaborate on that, but time is, is running out. So I'm just going to leave you with one last thing from the Musa Navim gives us. And he says, and, and, it, and it could be both interpretations are correct, but he says, uh, he says like this, I saw him, he says, this whole Pasuk was Doeg and was all Lush and Horror. It was all Lush and Horror. Why? Uh, <clears throat> That first of all, he says he knows how to play, right? Uh, so he's somebody, that means to say that he's somebody that people know how to ask questions to. Gibor, someone knows how to give answers. Now, he, he's, an, he's a guy who knows how to ask questions, he knows how to give good answers. A man of war, he knows how to fight the wars of Torah. Venavon Davar, he understands one thing from another. Ish Toar, he shows beautiful shine in halachas. Hashem Imo, and Allah is like him in every place. Notice this whole puzzle was interpreted what kind of scholar he is, much greater scholar. And we know uh, that uh, he said this all to uh, get Shaul upset at him. In other words, he's just like we you know, Avak Lashon is you don't say praises, excessive praises of somebody in front of another person. And remember, we learned long ago, Shaul was a person who could ask questions but couldn't answer them. He, he would bring up issues, but never could really come to the complete answer of, of the situation. And you know, that, that's the worst thing, to, to bring up many questions and many issues, but not really have the, the understanding to resolve the issue totally the way it should be resolved. So, in other words, when it came to Allah, Dovan Amalek, Allah was always like him. He's like an unbelievable guy. So, that, that's the Ra, because, you know, Doeg was a big advisor. You know, Doeg, whatever, was tight with Shaul. He knows, he can sense that Shaul's going to go on the way down. But, but Shoal's out, Doig's out. And of course, with those kinds of advisors, Doig wants to make sure he ensures his position as long as possible and somehow to keep Shoal propped up as the king. So on the one hand, he wants to bring, his, his idea, let's get someone to make the king feel better so at least he can function. And as long as he's functioning, I'm close with the king, so I have, I have a position. But that guy's got to make him function. He says he want, doesn't want just a minstrel. See, Doig says, let's get a minstrel. He'll be a bum, as long as he makes you happy. So Shaul says, no, I don't want to buy one at Tzaddik. Got yeah, Tzaddik, it's going to be hard. So you had to find somebody really good. Somebody really good, uh-oh, this could be a problem. This could be the next king. So I've got to make Shaul hate this guy so that he'll, he'll, he'll only use him to the point that for his own use, but not to have that anything more than that. So the Arabians already can begin to see the pieces coming to play in place here where Doeg is the one ultimately who always makes all the trouble for Shaul. And, and you know, you are as good as your advisors are and how well you listen to those advisors. And he had a lot of, and Doeg would always tell Shaul the things he wanted to hear. And Doeg certainly takes a great responsibility for a lot of the difficulties that happened. There's still more to talk about in this process. We'll continue this 